Hello, and welcome to another carefully curated book passage event. I'm your host, Paula Farmer. Um, we do so appreciate your support for this event, for our online events in general, our in-store events, and we always welcome you to come into the store, but let's keep supporting these wonderful online events from authors all around the world. You can also support Book Passage just by subscribing to this channel. It only takes you a few seconds and it really helps us out a lot. Um, speaking of the channel, we will be opening up the platform for your comments and your questions. So feel free to put them in our chat area and we promise we will get to them before the end of today's event. Um, based on our featured event and author, I think today's presentation will prove to be uh, much more so than just entertaining. I think it's going to be informative, helpful, and guaranteed to make your life a little better, maybe much better. Uh, please, please be actively involved and uh, definitely give us your comments and questions, especially given the topic. The featured book, The Eloquence of Silence, Surprising Wisdom and Tales of Emptiness, makes a provocative and compelling case for an easier, lighter way of moving through life in the world by embracing the peace, calm, and spaciousness of emptiness. Author Thomas More gently prods us to reconsider the need to constantly multitask, which we're all guilty of. In fact, multitasking may not be getting us anywhere, according to this book. Listening to our podcast or even our audio books while taking a walk or scanning our emails while pushing a stroller may mean missing the heart and soul of what is all around us. Um, and so, and it's also available to us anytime. It may be infinitely more beneficial to embrace the emptiness in our world and in our lives and be comfortable with quiet spaces. Thomas Moore is the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, Care of the Soul. He has written 24 other books about bringing soul to personal life and culture and deepening spirituality, finding meaningful work. He has been a Catholic monk, a university professor, and is also a psychotherapist. His work brings together spirituality, mythology, uh, in-depth psychology, and the arts while emphasizing the importance of images and imagination. He is joining us today from New Hampshire. With that, I'm gonna put it in his capable hands. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Paula, for that good introduction. Um, well, uh, I want to tell you first uh, who I am, because some of you people may not have read one of my books before. and. Uh, uh, Care of the Soul came out a long time ago, and at that time, probably a different generation, uh, a, a lot of people read it. And so I left my very private life, quiet life, uh, at home in New Hampshire, and went out uh, to speak about the uh, soul uh, everywhere, all over the place, I mean, all over the world. And I traveled a great deal. Fortunately, today I can talk to you on Zoom and uh, do it more quietly and more comfortably. So uh, I wrote several books about soul. Soul means, by the way, it means uh, the depth, the depth of our lives, our persons, and the depth of the world we live in. It's, uh, I say deep instead of high. So there's a difference between soul and spirit. Spirit tends to and spirit, which is very, very valuable, we all tend to want to reach farther and to transcend and explore the boundaries and the edges. Soul is more about home, like, uh, you know, uh, close to home, like family, uh, play, work, uh, the house you live in, uh, your neighborhood, the town where you live. All of that is very close to, uh, close to yourselves and, and, uh, that's why I want to talk about soul, write about soul so much. So that's trying to place the context of this new book of mine called um, The Eloquence of Silence. Uh, and it's really about silence, but also about emptiness in a larger sense. 
And uh, this is a spiritual term. So in this case, I kind of, uh, I feel that this book straddles both soul and spirit, the, the deeper intimate life, life that we lead, and also that, that uh, quest to go farther and to, uh, to practice, in a, practice our spirituality. These two really do go together. And uh, this book about emptiness, then, it's a, it was a little uh, problematical because how do I write about emptiness in the modern world today without making people think about empty lives and things being vacant and nothing happening? That's not what this emptiness is about, as I'm sure many of you know. Uh, the Eastern spiritualities like Zen Buddhism and Taoism talk about emptiness as an ideal, as a way to live and do things. What it means in those contexts mainly is, first of all, that you don't have a focus on yourself. The focus is not all on yourself. Or, uh, this, your life is not egotistical or self-absorbed. If you can get away from the self, at least somewhat, you're heading toward emptiness. You're also, uh, in that context, wanting to be empty in the sense that you are not attached to what you do. You don't, you don't uh, have to have the outcome you want. You don't have to insist on everything going the way that you expect it to go. You can let go of control and expectation. That's more of the spiritual approach to uh, emptiness. And what I wanted to do in this book was to explore emptiness and silence um, as uh, something more practical and part of our daily lives. And so I write this book in the context, as Paula was saying, a context in which we live our lives today in a very busy manner. Uh, many of us are busy, I, I would say that. I'm just too busy these days with this book on emptiness. Uh, I have to read it myself to get the message uh, home to me too. That we are too busy, we do too much, we use too many words. We, uh, we listen to so many words every day so much. Uh, and we fill our lives so that sometimes when something happens that's difficult to deal with, uh, we tend to want to fill our lives. We want to get, you know, buy a book that will help us, or we want to uh, go to a, a new teacher who will teach us new things, or we may want to just get into uh, into uh, therapy, uh, shopping therapy, and buy things. So we we do tend, I think, today to. When we feel emptiness, emptiness inside especially, we tend to want to fill it up with almost anything, something that will fill us up and make us uh, immune to some extent to that feeling of, the, of emptiness. So I'm suggesting a, a very different approach. And that would be, if you look around and see that your life is empty, what you could do is deepen that emptiness. In the psychology I work in, archetypal psychology, we call that going with the symptom. If your symptom is emptiness, you deepen your empty, your feeling of emptiness. You deepen it. Therefore, you might want to instead find some place where you can quietly sit and uh, be thoughtful. Uh, or, you know, just, just be there. You don't have to do anything. Or perhaps, for me, I'm a musician. I find that listening to music is really a good way, especially calming music, is a good way to be in touch with emptiness, to deepen your emptiness. Or maybe play. I play the piano. Every day I play the piano. I do it partly uh, as a spiritual practice, and I do see it as a kind of emptying of my attention and my concerns of the day. I can uh, get absorbed in the piano. And by both using my fingers and using my ears, listening to the music as I play, 
uh, I withdraw somewhat from all the activities that are about to happen. I usually play in the morning before I get the day started. I also play the piano before I write. As a writer, I find that playing the piano helps me a lot to, uh, to be in the right frame of mind to write and also to learn something from the music itself so that the writing is more musical. You could do something similar. You don't have to play the piano, but if you are a musician or have any musical ability, you could play a guitar or whatever instrument, a drum, whatever is, is around, or you could do something else. Maybe you like to, uh, to draw or paint. That's also a contemplative time where there's a great deal of emptiness. I know a lot goes on, but there's an emptying of the self that goes on in order to do an art like that, or a craft, or gardening, of course, be very much like that. Going into nature is uh, something everyone talks about as a solution to many things. Uh, it is also a way to get in touch with the emptiness that will make you feel more alive and make you more present to what is going on in your life. So any, I think any connection with nature can do that to you. I live on a pond here in New England. We call them ponds. They're like small lakes. And all I have to do is just look at the pond and I'm calmed. There's nothing there. There's nothing. I'm not doing anything. It's a mo moment of emptiness, an empty time. And that is refreshing. And it, what it does, it opens yourself up to uh, let other things happen, to let life happen. You need some emptiness in order to let something else come along. Which reminds me of one another idea in the archetypal psychology I do that we have is that the psyche is best in movement. It has to move at times. At times it has to be still and stuck even. But generally speaking, it's good if there is movement in the psyche. That might mean, oh, it could mean uh, trying out something new, like um, maybe if you have never painted before, you pick up a painting brush or go to a class at it. Or maybe you have been brought up in a, in a spiritual tradition and you feel drawn to try something that you've never tried before. So that is movement of the psyche, but there has to be some emptiness. If, for example, in the last example I gave, if you are, let's say you're very devoted to, uh, to yoga, which is wonderful in itself to, to do that. Um, one day, maybe by meeting somebody or reading a book or watching something on, online, uh, you get the idea that maybe I should see what this Zen Buddhism is all about. And so you, you give it a try, you, at least you read about it, or you uh, go to a talk, something like that, go to a workshop. There is some psychic movement there. It doesn't mean that this will catch on and that this will change your life radically. That doesn't happen too often. But there has to be some emptiness. If, if all you want to do is yoga, if that's kind of the limit, and you say, okay, this is what I believe in, then uh, and are not open to something new, the psyche doesn't move. And uh, that can be troublesome. We have to be, I th the movement is a sign of being alive, like alive within, alive in yourself. So I'd like to read you a couple passages from this book, um, The Eloquence of Silence. And the first one is a story. The first thing I want to read, well, I should tell you, this book is really a collection of stories about emptiness. It's not a long book explaining what emptiness is. There's no explanation in the book at all. It's just reflection. And um, so what I did, I collected some of the stories about emptiness that I've 
been reading and hearing and learning about for many, many years. This idea of emptiness is not new to me. It's been something that has uh, informed my own life and my work for maybe at least 30 years. So this is not new. My wife, my wife told me the other day that she heard me talking about writing a book on emptiness 20 years ago. So it's been something that is brewing in me. And uh, so what I did was collect these stories, 30 stories and other things besides stories, some passages, ideas from certain people that I really treasure. Um, and I collected the stories and then I wrote uh, a reflection on the story, something that will bring that story into your life, I hope. You'll be able to see how that story applies to you and to the, your experiences. So I'd like to start with one of these stories. Some of them, more than one of them, is about this character you may have heard of, Nasruddin who is a main character in Sufi stories, especially from the Middle East. And usually the stories are a little quirky and, and fun. So here's, here's this story called, How Many Tigers? One day the leader in his village asked Nasruddin to go hunting for tigers. Nasruddin felt he had to go, but he didn't want to. When he returned, his friends asked him, how did it go? Excellent, he said. How many tigers did you kill? None. How many did you encounter? None. How many did you see? None. Why do you say the hunt was excellent if you didn't see even one tiger? When you're hunting tigers, none is plenty. So I mean, a little quirky story. And, um, and yet, I think that story has some meaning for us. So let me read a little further, uh, just a little bit from my response to it. It sometimes happens that you get very involved in looking for something, when it would be better if you gave up the hunt altogether. Once, when I was a young man, I didn't know what my future would be. I felt I needed a job that was suited to my talents. So I applied for a position as a writer of training manuals for a large insurance company. As a test, they asked me to write a manual for anything at all, just to show my skills. So I wrote a very clear booklet on how a pipe organ works. This was something I knew about. I'm a musician. The company's hiring officer was shrewd. You've done an excellent job, he said, but you seem to be a real writer. We need someone who can just write a train manual, a training manual well, and has no aspirations as a writer. Sorry, we can't hire you. His logic was clear, but a bit twisted. We are looking for someone who can write well. You are a good writer, so we can't hire you. I'm gonna go one more paragraph. It's a good thing I didn't get that job. It would have killed my spirit. Not getting the job left me empty, open for a marvelous career that was waiting for me. In those days, if someone inquiring my, about my quest for a life work had asked, do you have any good leads? I could have answered, none is plenty. So there's an example about uh, an example about uh, emptiness in, in ordinary life. And uh, I, I, I think maybe Paula might have a question about that. Do you, Paula? I have a few questions. Okay. <laughs> I'm hoping you'll indulge me here. Um, sure. So you say when that we should allow ourselves to be quiet and not multitask as much as we normally do, like filling time and filling space. Yeah. Uh, 
that that doesn't have to be seen as a retreat from reality, but rather a rich and full welcome uh, in our lives to all that is most meaningful and what's really real. Um, I was wondering if you could expand on that because so much of the time we think of multi multitasking and filling up time and space and, and quietness uh, with productivity as a positive thing. Um, so I just thought you could kind of talk a little bit more about how the opposite is actually a little more meaningful and can kind of go a little bit further than just uh, filling up time and space. Sure, sure. Well, I'll just talk about myself first. I, um, I'm i a pretty empty person and I've, I've written now actually about 32 books at this time. And uh, so it's a lot of work, you know, I, I get a lot done. I feel, I feel quite productive, but at the same time, I've been trying to practice this emptiness all my life. One way to do that is to, uh, is to just take a dose. I, I like the idea of almost anything in the spiritual and psychological life to be done in doses rather than in big chunks. Mm -hmm. So if you have a dose of emptiness, if you can get a little bit of emptiness in your life, if you can take maybe five minutes in a day to do nothing, maybe to sit or to walk, uh, or to, as I said, to listen to music, when you could be more productive, but to really carve out that little time, it's like no time at all. But if you do that every day, that really will have a very real, a very real presence in your life. And it will have its effect. It doesn't have to be huge. Something very small can do it for us. So I want to be productive for sure. But at the same time, I want to be empty. That's interesting. And do you, when you say empty, should we not kind of conflate that with loneliness? Or is it sometimes uh, you could kind of uh, exchange those words, you know, because I, I feel like sometimes people not only have a problem with uh, filling their time or not having their time constantly filled, uh, but also feel like like they have to have constant sounds or um, they have to have people around them or something like that. And and so when I think of emptiness, sometimes I do think of what people would traditionally think of loneliness, but I don't know that that's yeah. what you're meaning. No, I don't think emptiness should be lonely. No, I don't think it would be either. For one thing, if you can allow some of this uh, empty quality in your life regularly, then I think you are probably more in tune with yourself. You know, you have time to listen what your thoughts are and maybe pay attention to what your emotions are and maybe even to kind of get a sense of toward the end of the day, what has happened in the day if you allow yourself some empty moments then. So I think actually it gives you more presence. And I find that, uh, well, I'm the kind of person that doesn't need a lot of uh, uh, people around. I, I don't get lonely for, the, for being alone, but um, it can happen. But I don't think that uh, there's a connection between emptiness and loneliness necessarily at all. It, you know, I, I think what you're right, though, that people might feel that, well, if I'm going to do this, this kind of thing that, that I'm calling emptiness, um, that I'm, it might pull me away from people. And uh, if it does that, I think probably you're not doing it the right way. Mm. Uh, because uh, uh, it doesn't have to be that at all. I, I mean, I'm kind of surprised at the question, I must say, because I don't equate loneliness and emptiness at all. E emptiness is a, is a very refined, it's kind of a kind of a very subtle thing to do. It's certainly not talking about uh, feeling empty, like there's nothing in you, nothing in your life. That's that's not it. Yeah. Um, but it is. Uh, uh, it is a kind of uh, clearing. It can be a clearing away, and it can happen at many different levels. For example, I'm really talking mostly today about uh, clearing out your mind, I guess. But it could also mean clearing out your schedule, mm -hmm. allow a little more time in your schedule, uh, what yeah. you do in the day. 
Yeah. Do you find that there are times uh, during the day or night where um, it can be more advantageous to do that, like maybe, or that it's a dedicated time uh, that you give to that either first thing in the morning or maybe in the evening, but maybe for some people they need it for right in the middle of the day to just kind of take a pause. Yeah, that's a very good point. I think that it's a good idea to have some time in the day that you can have a pause. Sometimes they come on by necessity. Just before coming here to talk to you today, I went to my cardiologist and I'm sitting in a waiting room, which um, is, is, a, is a test for emptiness because you have a choice. You can watch the TV that's up on the ceiling if you want, or you can grab a magazine or you could bring a book. I was thinking before I left to go to this appointment, should I bring a book? And I said, no, I think I'll just take an empty moment there. And that's what I do. I say, I'm just going to sit there. And I sit in the waiting room. I find that to be a very good empty moment. Well, yeah. And it's interesting that you mentioned the books, because obviously this is a book talk and you're an author. And we typically have a lot of uh, readers on, uh, writers on. Um, and obviously, I, you know, working in the book industry, I do a lot of reading. And um, I always feel, normally feel, if I'm going to the doctor, man, I either have to have my headphones to be listening to a book or bring a book with me. Um, but I love that you're saying that because these could be very convenient times, like an appointment, waiting for an appointment or knowing that you might be in line for something to just kind of take a pause there and maybe be reflective or just quiet. Yeah. Let me speak as a therapist for a moment. Um, one thing you can do too is notice if your activity is a, we would say, a defense against mm. emptiness. If if what you're doing, you know, it, it can go either way. Let's say if you're if you have uh, headphones on, uh, that could be just enjoying a moment of listening to music or to a book being read or to, you know, to be quiet that way. Or it could be, if you think about it and look at yourself, it could be a way of avoiding being alone or not doing anything or just being able to feel yourself for a few moments. If it's a defense against that, I think that's the time to experiment with emptiness and give it a try. Well, and I think this is an especially uh, helpful um, teaching, given that we're so bombarded with social media. Um, well, I say bombarded, you know, are we bombarded or are we giving into it? You know, there have been so many times in recent years, Thomas, that going out with friends, loved ones or whatever, like for dinner or something, where... It's like they can't even have a, a moment where maybe each other aren't speaking. So what do they first thing we people do? We now we pick up our phones and we're looking at our emails or looking up social media. And I think what you're saying is it's OK to either by yourself be alone with your thoughts and reflective and or regroup or even with somebody else. Like, why can't we? learn to just be okay with that and take advantage of it actually yes that's another good example and what i would say about that is that there's nothing wrong with looking at your your phone frequently there's nothing wrong with that that's fine but if you notice that you're in a situation that is a this really ought to be a social time when you can talk to people and listen to them not just talk, but listen. Listen, you know, that's something that is very important. And, and that sometimes I think it, we, we avoid listening by doing things. So if, if your, your phone is excessive, like it's too much, it's symptomatic, I would say. Your phone becomes a symptom of the fact that you really can't sit with your silence. Um, then that's a problem. And I would say that's, it's time to change your habit on that. Consider it, reflect on it and say, do I really want to do this? Am I 
missing out on things? Am I being rude to people sometimes? Am I cutting myself off from my friends? Well, in that case, the phone is not working very well. Its, it's dangerous side is showing itself. It has a very wonderful side, but it also has this danger side. And I think to be a mature adult, it would be a good idea to be able to know the difference between those things and to adjust your life accordingly. That's what this book is about. Yeah, yeah. The the devices shouldn't be um, kind of steering us. We should be steering the devices mm, using exactly. it when we need to, but not as filler. Um, I actually have an audience question. Um, mm. Physical pain presents an obstacle to the path to emptiness. Is there a way to find emptiness with physical pain? Yes, I understand. Uh, if, uh, and a lot of people are dealing with pain, uh, various kinds of pain, physical pain, even emotional pain. And uh, so that can interfere with emptiness because it's, it kind of crowds everything out. It's pretty hard to do something with, uh, with physical pain or even emotional pain. It, it, it takes over in a way. It's so, it's so important in a way. It becomes very big and so the question is, can you also then have some emptiness in there? Well, the first thing I would say is uh, repeat myself that a little bit goes a long way. So if there are any breaks in the pain uh, at all, you could take those moments to, uh, to, be, to feel relief by not doing anything. You know, we say this, in, uh, and maybe if you've done any reading in Eastern uh, spirituality, they always talk about not doing. The Tao Te Ching says, uh, much is accomplished by doing nothing. And, you know, that's kind of a, a point of Eastern wisdom. Uh, and I think, but I think we don't usually think of that as something very practical. So if we could find it, just if we're in pain, if there's any pause from it, that's one thing we could do to take advantage of it there. Another would be, if it's at all possible, to discover by, by experiment, to discover maybe something you can do that is distracting in a good sense, by dist distracting from the pain. If, if music does it, try that. If you've never tried it, music has great power if you listen to it in a way that you allow it to affect you and to uh, not just be something you do because you like it. It's not just entertainment. Think of music as medicine, music as therapy. You know, all these words have been used for music. And other things too, like if you do have pain, have some connection with the natural world. It's not just going into the quiet of nature, but if you just have a plant in your house, focus on it, sit down and look at it and consider it, you know, and be, be connected to it. I think I think those things might help uh, put the pain somewhat in perspective, even emotionally. Yeah, and it's uh, another, uh, actually not so much a question, but a comment from someone else that kind of goes along with this. Um, Allison says that uh, she, she read your book, got a lot out of it, um, and has read some of your other books as well. And that what she noticed is even if like in the middle of the day, when she has lo a lunch break, break from work, if she actually takes that part of that lunch break to just kind of be with herself and be still, that it actually makes her more productive when she goes back to work. So yeah, that's a good point that the, the yeah. emptiness there prepares you for doing something. It has that that capacity to make you make you better in a better state for what you want to do. So it's not just emptiness that is vacant that just doesn't go anywhere at all. It fits in. It's I'm not saying be empty all your life the whole time, but at in in uh, good moments, the moments that count, it will help you then in uh, where you are active. Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's amazing. And um, also, I wanted to know, speaking of um, Eastern philosophies, um, I'd like to hear a little bit more about some of your influences 
uh, on your teaching and also on your writing. Uh, although you're so you're obviously very prolific with your writing, it's very impressive. But I'm assuming that you've been influenced as well. Oh yes, I have. Um, I started out when I was a young person. I'm a child, really. Uh, I became a, a Roman Catholic monk, entered a religious order, and I was in it for about uh, 13 years. I started when I was only 13 years old. It was kind of a thing people did in the, those early days when I was a child. Uh, and then I, uh, when I left that, I became very interested in, uh, in Eastern thought and Eastern religions, especially Zen Buddhism. Zen really meant a lot to me because the, the, the one power of Zen that really I like very much is that it doesn't allow you to get stuck on anything. Like it's like it pulls the rug out from everything you get too comfortable with. And I think that's a very good thing to have in life, something that will help you not get stuck or or too too swept away by something, by a by a person, a book, a philosophy, a course that you know, anything at all can can uh, take over you. And Zen doesn't allow that to happen. So I like that. I like that spirit of Zen. Um, and then I discovered the. Uh, uh, Sufis, especially the Sufi uh, teachers who teach by story or by music or by dance. I was very interested in how the arts and that spirituality go together because I feel very strongly that uh, the fine arts are primarily their spiritual practice rather than an entertainment. So, and they're also healing in so many ways. So I, I really trust the arts to do a lot of that. And I've been involved ever since I've been a psychotherapist with uh, people who practice, uh, well, they call it different things, art therapy or expressive therapy, uh, because I think that there is something in the power of the arts themselves that uh, that heals us and gives us a vision. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious you said was was I hearing you wrong? Did you say you became a monk when you were 13? You heard me right. That's what I said. It's it seems very shocking today to, you know, if I say that to people today, they think I'm I'm nuts. But the fact is in those days, when I was a kid, that was a long time ago, and I was in a Catholic community. My family were all, you know, Irish Catholics and and it was it wasn't unusual in those days for a young, very young person to go to high school as part of this uh, monastic practice. It wasn't the full the full thing, you know. It wasn't a, a full monastic practice, but it was it was really quite quite serious actually. And so I got through that. If I can say one more word about that, because I don't want to make people think this is too weird. Um, I think what this did to me, I, I wonder about it a lot because I love my family and was very, very attached to them. And it was very difficult for me to leave them to join this monastic order. Um, but I feel now that it, it told me, the desire to enter this thing pulled me away from the smaller life I would have had at home. Mm -hmm. And it opened up a bigger world for me. And I think, I really think that today, writing all these books, doing a lot of teaching, doing a lot of therapy, uh, with, with, I think, considerable depth. I, I bring the spiritual and the psychological together. Um, I don't do this in a superficial way. And I think that it began when I left home. I think this whole thing began the time I left home and it it was my preparation in order to be to have the vocation or the the do the work that I do today. Yeah, and I mean just to be very clear, I don't think that it's weird. I, I thought okay. it's I thought very unusual, like maybe in a different culture, an Eastern culture wouldn't have seemed unusual, but for someone in the Western culture or a Catholic monk, I never had heard of that. Uh, but I also think it's very 
I picture you being a very wise beyond your years 13 year old. Well, I know. when I think about what most 13 year olds today or even 13 year olds when I was 13 were thinking about. So I, I am I'm impressed. Yeah. Well, don't be too impressed because uh, I don't think it was so much wise beyond my years. If anything, it was the opposite. I think I was just swept away. I just, I, I saw these priests uh, at the church where in school where I was going at the time. I saw the life they lived and what they did. And I thought to myself, I'd like to do that. I thought that's really a, a good goal for me in my life. I don't, I didn't, I didn't sort it out. I didn't have many ideas about it, but I was emotionally captivated by it. And so uh, that's how it began. I don't think it was terribly intelligent. It was just, it was just uh, a young person's idealism. Well, and I also very much agree with you about um, healing and um, that the arts and healing and inspiration that the arts can bring. Um, you know, my mother was very influential bringing art into my life at a young age, and it's carried me through adulthood. Yeah. And I 100% agree with you. There's just something, especially if it's like a particular arts that really attract you, What, like you said, be it music or actual art painting, paintings. And um, there's just so many film is art. I mean, there are just so many uh, areas, avenues of art that can really have such a positive impact on our daily lives. And I love that you're saying that this can be part of uh, the emptiness that's actually fulfilling. I think there's a lot of, I said this, I guess, but I think there's a lot of emptiness in art and the practice of art and also just uh, uh, bringing art into your life, whatever the art art is, whatever it is, because I know I my my wife is a painter. She's really a very serious painter, and um, she's she's at her studio right now as I talk to you, painting, uh, and was, could, couldn't wait to get to the studio today. Uh, and I think what she does, she knows a great deal about art and has great skills she's developed over the years as a painter. At the, on the other hand, she's she uh, she stands in front of that blank canvas. You know, the canvas is empty. And she's got to figure out what to do. And she's got to make a mark and do something with what she she sees there. And to me, that's the hardest thing. What do you do with that that blank canvas? I guess for me, too, it's the, the empty sheet of paper, you know, the fresh right. sheet starting a new book. Um, it's It's similar. And uh, so I love those those times of emptiness, and I see how fruitful they can be. Yeah, I agree with you. I've, I've been uh, working on a writing project myself for the last several months. And yeah, facing getting into a structure of daily writing, but facing the empty page, it's 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 very interesting. Sometimes it's frustrating, but I find that I get, I always end up kind of reaching the goal and feeling more fulfilled, you know, from facing that empty page. Uh, the two, the two are right. connected. Yes, two are connected. yes. The, the goal and what you get at the end and what you start with. I mean, it's like you can't, you couldn't get there without that empty page or the empty canvas, you know, the empty page. Uh, the, there's another side to it too, in the same vein that, um, I'm very interested in inspiration, how we get inspired to do what we do, whatever it is, but especially with you know artistic work. We talk a lot about inspiration. We talk about a muse. The, um, the ancient philosophers use the word daimon for that, a presence that gives you ideas and gives you the enthusiasm to get started with all of that. I think that's very important in the work. Uh, and so, but, but I also think that if you can't hear what that is, if you can't hear that voice that urges you on and gives you a direction, then you really can't do the work you want to do. That, that, that other power is very, I hope you understand me, I just mean like a, you know, like a muse. 
that uh, that other potency that you have and guidance that you can feel can only come to you and be useful to you if you are empty enough to take it in. If you're full of your own ideas, or if you, all you do is act and just start working without listening, then you may not have the material you need with its with the passion connected to it to be able to do something worthwhile. Oh, absolutely. That makes so much sense. And um, having uh, hosted and interviewed many, many, many authors and writers, uh, they always at some point kind of discuss their influences and their what inspires them. And often it's other writers and certain very specific books like maybe before they get into a new project, they immerse themselves uh, themselves into other a certain other writer or writers. Yeah. Uh, I've heard musicians say the same thing. I think it's yeah, but it's taking that time. I, I, one uh, author said she took a whole summer just to reread all of Toni Morrison um, before she started her project in the fall and. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's there's definitely something to that. And you know, there's some emptiness in what you just said too, a very uh, slight emptiness, uh, where you allow you, where you are able to allow another person to inspire you or to be the focus of your work. That means you have to empty yourself a little bit. You know, you have to say, I'm not the only important thing here. There's this other author that I want to bring out and make very present, and mm -hmm. that takes an emptying, emptying of yourself. It's what the that's what the in the Christian tradition they call kenosis, and the emptying of the self. Mm -hmm. So that's a particular kind of emptying. There are different ways to empty. One of them is kenosis, that uh, a very important ability, not to have to know everything, uh, not to be the best at everything, but to empty yourself and let somebody else uh, be the focus now. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this has been so fantastic. Uh, it, this talk has been inspiring. You, sir, have been inspiring uh, to me and I'm sure to a lot of our audience as well. We've gotten a lot of comments and um, people are uh, soaking it in, which is important. Be empty, soak it in. Also, I would say, take advantage that we have this book and Book Passage has many copies, both in San Francisco location and our Corte Madera location. And um, it's thank you for publishing this in paperback. Um, I think that makes it uh, more accessible, importable, affordable. Uh, so, yes, we have plenty of these in both our locations. Feel free. You can even order while you're watching this because we have a link right below where you can order it online. But I think, yeah, this is, uh, to me, Thomas, this is like a great, um, not obviously not coffee table book, but bedside book. Because mm -hmm. you can take your time to read it and get something out of each chapter whenever you pick pick it up. That's what people tell me. They mm -hmm. they like they like two things about it. It's short. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not a big overwhelming job to have to read this book. And the other thing is that it's it's divided up with all these stories. It makes no difference what or, order you read order. the stories. Yeah, and you can always go back to it. Yeah. You know, underline, highlight, go back to the things uh, that matter most and inspire you. Uh, I think that's a good note to end on, Thomas. If unless okay. there's anything else you wanted to get in, I don't want to cut you short. No, no, no. Thank you very much for uh, for talking with me. That was so useful to be able to have that little bit of dialogue. I appreciate. Oh, it very much. my honor, sir. My honor, Thomas. Um, and thank you, Book Passage audience, for joining us. Whether you're joining us live or later in the archives, as mentioned, we do have the eloquence of silence, um, and it's a uh, Definitely the book to have this year on your nightstand, referring to it and passing it along. I also like when people get books like this, they get something out of it and they pass it on to people. Um, so with that, thank you for joining us. 
Thank you for supporting this event, this author, and until the next time, have a good day.